What is venetoclax? So venetoclax is a BCL2 uh, antagonist, and a, a BCL2 inhibitor. And BCL2 is a very important protein in most cancers, right? Because it's an anti-apoptotic mechanism in the sense that it keeps the cell from dying, right? Apoptosis is the programmed cell death that every cell should go through. And BCL2 has a, a big pl role to play. Venetoclax targets specifically BCL2. And that BCL2 uh, inhibition is important because it basically opens the door for those cells to finally die in that mechanism, right? We have other pathways that lead to apoptosis, but we have several clinical trials that have demonstrated that the, inhib the inhibition of BCL2 leads ultimately to those myeloma cells dying, which is ultimately the goal that we want. How is venetoclax administered? Venetoclax has been extensively studied, possibly in the past 10 years, uh, and that all that research came from especially B-cell malignancies, like lymphomas, because we're very familiar with venetoclax in that domain. Most recently, we have seen a lot of clinical trials that focus on venetoclax as a single agent, as well as in combination. It all started with a phase one clinical trial that was a dose escalation uh, study for this drug, and it was monotherapy, and then they added, they did a cohort expansion to add dexamethasone to it. The schedule for this dose is that it's, uh, this medication is a week uh, daily uh, oral medication, okay? So initially they started at 400 milligrams, 800 milligrams in another group, and ultimately the dose that has been established in other clinical trials has been 800 milligrams daily. Typically we do this on a 28-day cycle when it's in a combination. So the phase one trial that led to the to further studies in, uh, of venetoclax in combination demonstrated responses of an overall response rate around 40% on its own. When they added dexamethasone, it was about 65%. And obviously, that created a lot of interest. Then they started looking at the alternative of venetoclax in combination with dexamethasone and another agent, such as protosome inhibitors. Because in oncology, we have a very common concept of adding drugs if they're to, to see if they have synergy, but more importantly, if they don't have cumulative toxicity. Uh, and that way we can tackle different pathways at the same time and try to kill as, my, as many bad guys as we can in the process. Protosome inhibitors that have been studied in myeloma uh, in combination with venetoclax, we have bortezomib, which is um, probably one of the most commonly used of protosome inhibitors, and this was on the Bellini trial. The Bellini trial was um, a phase three clinical trial that uh, compared bortezomib, venetoclax, and dexamethasone versus just venetoclax and, and de dexamethasone. Interestingly enough, this trial initially had to be stopped by the FDA, right? Because they initially presented with an increased numbers of death in the, in the trial. There were about a five deaths on, on, on that trial, if I remember correctly. And ultimately, they, they, they realized that it came down from uh, complications that arise from the treatment, mainly infections. Uh, at the same time, because this trial originally was designed for all comers, right? They did the subgroup analysis and realized that the patient that clearly benefited from the addition of venetoclax to Velcid was the subgroup of patients that had a translocation 1114. A translocation 1114 is basically a piece of chromosome 11 and a piece of chromosome 14 swapping places, right? And so, those patients benefited from the addition of venetoclax tremendously, and they did not have the complications that led to dying in the other patients. So that's why we currently use, as, of, as an off-label use, uh, venetoclax for patients with translocation 1114 only. Patients that do not have translocation 1114 or do not have BCL2 expressions should not be starting on venetoclax. Right now, it's not FDA approved. Uh, we only use it as off-label. Venetoclax has also been uh, studied in combination with other very common drugs like carfilzomib, another protosome inhibitor, uh, and daratumumab, which is an anti-CD38. They both led to tremendous responses. If you look at the overall response rates for the Bellini trial in combination with fortezomib, we're talking about overall response rates in the 90%. For obviously for those patients with translocation lm 14 right, that subgroup of patients. And a progression-free survival that is the stability of the disease of almost 36 months compared to barely nine months uh, in the comparator arm. Daratumumab 
resulted in, in, in similar numbers, right? The, the addition of daratumumab for, uh, to venetoclax led to overall response rates over 90%. So those are very impressive and encouraging numbers for a population that is so heavily pretreated. In all these trials, these patients received a median line of therapy around five. So that's, you know, that, that's a hefty number of, of previous lines of therapy for them. Most recently, there is another study that is evaluating the patients uh, with translocation 1114 um, to receive venetoclax in combination with pomalidomide, uh, which is another oral agent. It's still accruing. It's still ongoing. So we don't have, obviously, any data for that. But, you know, it's, it's a very appealing option for a patient uh, because it would be an or oral alternative, right? Just pills, pills, and pills. And that makes, it simplifies the life for the patients without going, having to go to the infusion center to get dosed. Is ramp-up dosing needed when using venetoclax in the myeloma setting? The dosing for venetoclax, very different to B-cell malignancies, uh, does not require a step-up dose, right? A ramp-up, as we call it. Um, in B-cell malignancies like lymphomas, the main driver of that ramp-up ramp is the fact that we can encounter TLS, or tumor lysis syndrome. And tumor lysis syndrome is a, is a life-threatening complications, okay, that can put the patient in, in, in grave danger if it's not managed appropriately. As a result, we do this ramp-up in which we escalate the dose on a weekly basis. Myeloma, that's not the case. In all the studies that we've seen uh, with venetoclax, there has not been clear evidence of TLS. Uh, as a result, we start the patients on the standard dose of either 400 or 800 milligrams daily. There is not a set, I mean, if you look at all the trials, both doses have been studied. Ultimately, it's a matter of tolerance uh, because venetoclax can have uh, a very notorious toxicity, mainly gastrointestinal, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea can happen, uh, but most importantly, hematological, like decreasing their blood counts, mainly platelets and white blood cells. So a higher risk of infections can occur. That's actually what happened on the Bellini trial with all these deaths, right? That, uh, that uh, patients were, were in trouble from infections, not so much TLS. TLS is not something that we encounter typically in myeloma. What are common side effects and how are they managed? So the main side effects that we encounter with venetoclax are gastrointestinal uh, and hematological. The way that we manage those side effects. Obviously, uh, if the problem is nausea, vomiting, and diarrhea, we can use medications to help with this, to mitigate the side effects. Uh, but we could also consider reducing the doses, right? So if we started the patient on an 800 dose, going down to the 400 milligram dose uh, makes sense, right? Because at the end, the, the rule of thumb is that we cannot become worse than the disease. We cannot provide more side effects than the benefit that the drug is actually given. Um, if the problem is hematological and it's Again, mainly uh, platelets and white blood cells. So if the patient has very low white blood cell count, there are a higher risk of infections. We want to mitigate those. If the patients develop severe neutropenia, which is um, quantified by less than 500 neutrophils, then we start the patient on prophylactic uh, antibiotics. All right, We consider always um, uh, an antibiotic, an antiviral, and if need be, an antifungal as well. But that's for the patients that really get very low on their numbers. When the playlists go down, then risk for bleeding can increase, of course. Um, and, and, and again, we want to make sure that the patients eat as, is at a safe level in terms of, of their blood counts. So once again, if we need to dose reduce and go from 800 and go to 400 milligrams, that's perfectly fine. As a matter of fact, there are a lot of uh, myeloma doctors that would simply start the patient at 400. And if tolerated, we can escalate to 800. That would, uh, that would be another very reasonable approach to mitigate the side effects. Uh, the most important thing is that all these side effects, when, uh, when venetoclax is used in combination with other agents, such as bortezomib, such as carfilzomib, such as daratumumab, those side effects are not necessarily cumulative. Okay, so they, they, they kind of preserve the original toxicity that we can encounter with those agents, right? But the cytopenias are not necessarily going to be worse. The, the GI toxicity is not necessarily going to be worse. Um, we just need to be aware of them. I always say we have to be aware of the side effects, but not necessarily be afraid of them. If the white blood cell count is too low, sometimes we can also provide the patients with growth factors like Neupogen, Nulasta, and, and that will help them increase the, the neutrophil count to keep them out of trouble. And that is something that we can consider in, in myeloma because it will not have a negative impact on the disease. I will not 
have a negative impact, impact in the efficacy of, efficacy of the drug as well. So that is a consideration, especially to keep the, pa the patient at a safe level. Should prophylactic IVIG be considered to prevent possible infections? Myeloma is a disease that involves that comes from plasma cells, right? And the job that plasma cells do is to produce those proteins, those antibodies. The disease on its own can put the patient on a, what we call a, on a <laughs> hypogamma globulinemic state, uh, state. So that will put them uh, at risk for infection on its own. Every do drug that we use uh, currently in myeloma can also increase the risk of um, low levels of, of IgG. And this IgG, when it hits 500, the patient, uh, the patients start having a higher risk of uh, infections and recurrent infections, especially upper respiratory tract infections can occur. Whenever the patient are below 500 and has recurrent infections, IVIG should be considered. Um, also, if the patient is having an ongoing infection that has not resolved, we can boost the patient with IVIG to help them uh, increase their immune system that way. Is venetoclax therapy a fixed duration or is it taken until progression? Whenever we start a patient on treatment, we know that the treatment for the most part is going to be until this disease progression or intolerable side effects. And that applies to any line of therapy. At some point, we can talk about maintenance, right? Like, for instance, right after transplant, we talk about Revlimid maintenance, Velcade Revlimid maintenance, whatever the case may be based on the biology of the disease. Once we have relapse of these diseases at some point and we start venetoclax in combination with something, uh, then we continue this treatment for as long as we can, meaning until disease progression or intolerable side effects. And we continue with the same doses. We don't decrease necessarily the dose of venetoclax based on a maintenance, quote unquote. Um, we could, however, and we should adjust the dose of the other agent. For example, bortezomib can be given days 1 and 15 rather than days 1, 8, and 15. Um, carfilzomib can be given also days 1 and 15. And that's especially if the patient is having issues with toxicity, right? Because again, we want to minimize the risk of them having toxicity. When we use um, daratumumab, we know that the schedule for daratumumab is going to be weekly for eight doses, then every other week for eight doses, then monthly until this is progression or intolerable side effects. So the monthly daratumumab kind of becomes the maintenance, but you keep going with the venetoclax on a daily basis. Who are the target population for venetoclax trials? The target population for a venetoclax trial is very simple. Anybody who has a translocation 1114. In myeloma, we have a really good problem to have, and is that nowadays we have extended the life expectancy of our patients by a big margin. But we did that through clinical trials, through research. So analyzing that subgroup of population that has a translocation 1114 is very important. Uh, because it will ultimately lead to potentially an FDA approval for this medication, which means another drug that we can use for them. Anybody who has a translocation 1114 and there is any a clinical trial that is available should definitely consider it because ultimately it's going to uh, benefit everybody, including themselves. Thanks for watching. By creating a Health Tree account, you can get exclusive access to the latest Health Tree University content, track your course progress.